Hello everyone, for the last two weeks I've been adding 2D and Android support to my game engine. No Digital Thomas I hear you ask? Well I know everyone likes him. Well, actually I like Real Thomas more. Anyways, the point of this video is gonna be 2D and Android. And we're gonna go over everything you need to take into consideration when porting a game engine to a different platform and more specifically a mobile platform. Now the main reason why I added 2D support to my engine was just to be able to draw some debug text and debug shapes, but I figured since I made a 2D engine anyways, let's make a game on it. Well, actually, I made a clone of a game a good friend of mine once made called Flexus. It's available on the Google Play Store, I'll leave a link below, and as you can see, it runs on my own engine on Android. So, we've got a lot to cover, let's dive into it. First of all, let's start by having a look at the game. Of course, initially it ran on my PC and this is actually great because you can develop games cross-platform first on PC and then just compile it for Android or maybe in the future iOS, who knows. So the premise of the game is that you've got this blue line which you can bend using your mouse or finger depending on the device you're using. And then you've got a dot which moves across that line and the goal is to move that dot through a circle. By doing so you score points and the game is over whenever you touch a bullet. I'm not very good at the game but I guess it's somewhat addictive and you might keep playing to get that high score as well, high as possible. Now, the next step was of course to take the engine and move it to Android. So, can be that difficult, I hear you ask. Well, think again. There's quite a lot of differences and the truth is that porting to a mobile is somewhat even more difficult than porting to another desktop platform like Linux or Mac OS. One of the first things that's probably gonna be apparent is the input. On a PC you use a mouse and keyboard and on a mobile device you use a touchscreen. And the goal here is to try and make an interface that kind of uses both of them but without having to write too much specific code either to handle mouse and keyboard or to handle the touchscreen. You want everything to reuse as much code as possible and only diverge where it's absolutely necessary. The second thing is loading files. For example, loading a font or loading an image. On a PC, all you have to do is just load the file and it turns out C++ has built-in functions to do that. Now on Android and mobile phones, it turns out that's a bit more tricky because it doesn't really have the concept of storing files to disk. Well, sure, you can store your images, but when it comes to the data of an application, that data is actually bundled inside of the application, which makes it very easy to redistribute that application, but it also imposes a little bit of a problem as to how you query those resources and actually load them into memory. And sure, Android has an API for that, provide some code which allows you to load these resources, but of course that had to be integrated into the engine. Another big thing is with Android, C++ is not really the recommended language. You can run pretty much all C++ code on an Android device, but the problem is that most of the APIs are not really written for Android. So whenever you need to interact with the device, get some data, like take an image for example, or get the user's input. It's gonna be much easier to do that with Java, which is actually the preferred language for Android development. And now you have to somehow bind this Java code to the C++ code using something called the GNI, or Java Native Interface. And in terms of C++, there are also something called the NDK, or Native Development Kit, which allows you to do some of these things purely from C++, but once again, it's a very limited subset of what is possible. Finally, we need to talk about build systems. When you've got a language like, let's say, Python, you go to the official website, python.org, you download Python, you write a little program, you hit run, and it just works. With C++, however, you write your program and then you have to somehow convert it into a bunch of zeros and ones that your computer can actually run. 
The problem is that we don't really have a standardized way to do that. Pretty much every single IDE, that being Visual Studio, Xcode, Android Studio or whatever other exotic thing you're using, has its own format to describe which files should be merged together to build the final application. Now there are some alternatives available and those are called build systems or make systems and probably the most widely supported one is CMake. Problem is I don't really like the syntax and it's rather old. So for now I just maintain two different formats, the Visual Studio one and a CMake file which is what Android Studio uses for C++ code. But I'll probably roll out either my own system or look into CMake or an existing alternative in the future. All right, so finally I wanted to have a look at the actual game code for the game. There will be a link to that code as well in the description. Now for the engine code that hasn't been pushed to GitHub yet, however if you want to get access today consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash floaty monkey where you get immediate access to all of the code we write and once again it will also be available on GitHub at some point in the future but for now it needs a little bit of cleanup to say the least. So let's dive into the code. The first thing we do is obviously include the engine itself. Then we've got this little enum which describes the game state and that can be either showing the start screen, showing the screen with the score and showing the actual game itself. Then we've got this bullet structure which keeps track of the position of a bullet, the x and y coordinates on the screen, the direction of the bullet which is a normalized 2D vector that either points up, down, left or right, and we also keep track of the velocity so that bullets can start slowly and gradually move faster over time. The get head function returns the position and the get tail returns the other side of the bullet which we can easily calculate by taking the position, subtracting the direction times the length of our bullet which in this case is 25 pixels. Then we've got some global state, we've got the width and height of our screen as very short variables right here just for convenience. We got a random number generator. We obviously keep track of the mouse position since that controls the entire game and the target position which is that circle we need to go through each time to score points. Then we keep track of the game state and also a list of bullets which we will fill in just a moment and of course we also keep track of the score and high score. Then we've got these helper functions, is point in circle, it does exactly what it says. It checks if a point is in a circle with this specific position and this specific radius. Is point in rectangle does the exact same thing but for a rectangle. And then get point on Bezier returns a 2D coordinate of a point on a cubic Bezier curve. These four vector 2s contain the control points of that cubic Bezier curve and this t value is a value between 0 and 1 that describes where we are on the curve. Then we've got some join functions, first of all the function to draw the start screen and if you are familiar with the HTML5 canvas API this should look very very similar. There's pretty much nothing too spectacular going on here, we just draw some text and the start button. Then we've got the draw score function which is very similar, we just display the score and if the score is bigger than or equal than the high score then we set the new high score to be the score and we show a little message that says that you've got a new high score. Then we get to the most advanced function, draw game. On top we keep track of the total time, which we just do by always adding up the delta time to it. Then we calculate a t parameter, which will kind of oscillate based on a sine wave, and we divide by 2 and add 0 0.5 to map it from a range between negative 1 and 1 to a range between 0 and 1. Then we calculate the position of the dot that moves along the line by using this get point on Bezier function. We give it the start position of the line and the end position of the line. The two control points are the mouse position and the t value is the one we just calculated. Then we draw the actual curve, we also draw the target which is that circle we need to pass through and we draw the moving circle which we can control. 
Then we update the velocity and position of all bullets, which is pretty trivial. The velocity should always get increased by the acceleration times our delta time, and the position needs to get increased by the direction of our bullet times the velocity of the bullet times the delta time. And once again, this works because direction is a normalized vector. Then we draw all the bullets in here. We also draw the score. And then we check if there is any collision between the player and the target or the target circle. If there is, we set a new position for that target circle and we increase the score. Then we check for player bullet collisions by checking if either the head or tail of the bullet is inside the circle. And if it is, we set the game state to show the score. Then we spawn new bullets until the maximum number of bullets is reached, which is 8. We first create a new bullet and we have this margin variable that says how much the bullets should keep away from the edges of the window. Then we get a random number in the range 0 to 3 and based on that we create some bullets that either move down, up, left or right. And we also set their initial position and then we push back that bullet onto the bullets list or array we had earlier. And then finally we need to remove off-screen bullets. This line and this bottom line here are just a C++ way of removing bullets and basically when this the lambda returns true, uh, the bullet will get removed, and if it returns false, it won't remove the bullet. Then we've got some engine provided functions which get invoked by the engine. Setup runs once at the start of the game, and all we do here is just create a new font called Aspergit Bolt, which we load from a TTF file. Then we update the game and nothing fancy is going on here either. We set our width and height convenience variables equal to the width and height of the, our canvas. We set the actual font we loaded earlier and we also use a round line cap which looks a bit more pleasing. Then we draw a rectangle that fills up the entire screen so we've got a solid background. And then we draw either the start screen, the score screen or the game itself based on the game state. Finally, we've got this little input function which contains a boolean down which says if the mouse is currently down as well as the mouse position. If the mouse is currently down and the game state is not game, we should reset the game, basically set the score to 1, remove all bullets and choose a new random position for our target circle and then we will switch the game state to game so the game can actually start. And then we also copy over the position of the mouse to that convenience variable we declared up top. And that is pretty much everything there is to it in 260 lines of code. Alright, that was everything I wanted to discuss in this video. I don't know what we'll be doing next time, but I'm sure it will be something interesting. So if you don't want to miss that video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a thumbs up, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.